All right, well, thank you. My name is Lou Tornabeni. I'm a postdoc in vertebrate zoology, and today I'll be talking about a project that I've been fortunate to be involved in over the last year or so called the Deep Reef Observation Project, or DROP for short. So DROP is an organization that operates out of the southern Caribbean here in, in the island of Curacao, and the goal of it is to characterize Caribbean deep reef biodiversity, the evolutionary origins of species that live on Caribbean deep reefs, and establish baseline data that will help us monitor the long-term health of deep reefs in the Caribbean. And the cool part about DROP is that we achieve most of our research through this really awesome manned submersible called the Kirasub, which is a five-person submersible that can send down to 1,000 feet deep and collect samples using a variety of me mechanical arms and suction devices, as you'll see just in a couple of videos in a minute. But first, it's important to understand what deep reefs are and why they're important. And as their name would suggest, deep reefs are the environment that occur below what we traditionally consider a shallow warm water coral reef, where most of the organisms are based around photosynthetic corals. In contrast, the deep reefs begin in this mesophotic zone at about 50 meters and con continue all the way down to below 300 meters. And this zone harbors a really unique and diverse group of fishes and invertebrates that are ecologically and taxonomically distinct from everything that occurs above them or below them in the shallow reef or deep sea environment. And to date, we've been really limited in understanding what actually is in this deep reef community, largely because scuba diving doesn't allow us to get a below approximately 15 meters. And so with the advent of manned submersibles like the Kirasub, we can begin to explore the entire deep reef slope, collect samples, and have a lot of really interesting discoveries. Some of these discoveries I'm going to talk about today, most of them occurred within the last two or three years, including my year as a postdoc. And so anytime you have explorative research in a new environment, the chances are you're going to uncover a lot of new species. And this is exactly what we're finding, dozens and dozens of new species of fishes and invertebrates. Here I'm just showing 10 fishes that were described within the last two or three years. And behind each one of these is usually an interesting story beyond the taxonomic description. And I'll talk about one of them, this one here in the top right, this elongate yellow sea bass. So this is a submersible, um, using a six and a half ton submersible to chase down a four inch fish. And um, this is Liapropoma ulnii, a species that was described by Carol Baldwin and Dave Johnson. And the cool story about this is that the adults live in this habitat that you're seeing here around 600 feet in this really deep, uh, cool uh, mesophotic reef environment. However, the larvae were actually discovered four or five years prior to us even knowing about the adult as a pelagic larvae off the coast of Florida. And we actually didn't even know what genus the larvae belonged to because it looked so distinct from this animal that you're seeing here. And it wasn't until we collected this species, not very easily, with a submersible and compared it to the larvae using DNA barcoding and osteology that we were able to make this link between this pelagic, shallow water Florida specimen with this deep water, uh, beautiful basil that you're seeing here captured. Now beyond finding just new species, we're also seeing some familiar, familiar faces at new depths. Unfortunately, some of these familiar faces are the invasive lionfish in the Caribbean that you see here on this artificial habitat. This is an anchor at about 700 feet. And as you see, as we ascend this anchor up the deep reef slope off Dominica, you'll see one lionfish after the other. And we found them basically about as deep as the submersible goes. And we don't just find them in this patchy distribution, we often find them in large abundances, both on natural habitats as well as artificial habitats, like you're seeing here. This is a submerged chain around 500 feet, and you can see easily there's about a dozen lionfishes on this particular set. And so off Dominica, in just 10 dives, we saw more than 239 lionfishes down to a depth of 805 feet, which is a record for the Caribbean. So this isn't great news. Now, Anytime there are lionfish, we have new interactions with native and invasive fauna. So what I'm circling here is a small school of goby fishes, about an inch long. And this lionfish is hurting this school against the deep reef slope, darting and eating these native fishes. Now this is particularly problematic because not only is this a native fish, but the species that it's eating right now is an undescribed, unnamed species of goby that is only known from deep reefs in the Caribbean. So you're watching the first record of an invasive species eating an unnamed species, which is exciting and also depressing. But in case the event that we are able to actually collect the specimens before the lionfish gobbles them up, we can incorporate these into molecular phylogenies of the shallow water species as well. For example, this is a molecular phylogeny of gobies, a small group of fishes in the Caribbean, and we find that there are four independent invasions onto deep reefs from shallow water ancestors. And not only do some species transition from shallow to deep, but in three of those clades, we're able to see that once they get down there, they're continuing to diversify. 
So we have speciation events going on exclusively within the deep reefs where well-adapted species are able to exploit new niches. And they're able to do so because of some really unique adaptations. All the deep reef species of gobies that we've examined to date seem to have this expanded hemal arch in the vertebrae, which allows the posterior extension of a gas bladder, whereas their shallow water counterparts either have a small gas bladder or no gas bladder at all. We're also looking into the adaptations of approximately 17,000 protein coding genes, including genes that code for visual proteins in their, op in their uh, eyes, to see if there are specific adaptations to deep water lifestyles versus the shallow water species that they're related to. Keep in mind, all of this has taken place in just two sampling localities, in uh, Curacao and Dominica. So over the next couple of years, we're going to be expanding and using new submersibles and new sites, pending funding, of course. Um, and hopefully these new opportunities will lead to new questions and hopefully some new answers. Thank you. We see, oh, sorry, the question was, what's the significance of the gas bladder expansion? As we go from shallow to deep, we see a transition in the, in the, in the trophic um, niches of these fishes where planktivory seems to be more important than herbivory because there's less things for them to graze on. Most of the planktivores are hovering species. And so if you have a gas bladder and you're a small fish and it's a kind of a resource limited environment, being able to regulate your gas bladder in a very, and regulate your buoyancy and hovering in a very efficient manner is a great adaptation. And we indeed, for the gobies, we see many more hovering species at depth than we do in the shallows. So it's an adaptation, presumably, for feeding and, and for hovering. Um, I think my interest in fishes, and specifically in deep reef fishes, um, is really rooted in taxonomy. Um, as a passion, I know many of you out there are also um, passionate taxonomists, and so when we think about where are we likely to find new discoveries and new species and, and new relationships, um, coral reefs right off the bat pop out as one of the, idea, one of the ideal places to find that. And m much of the coral reefs around the world and shallow habitats have already been really extensively studied. So in a way, deep reefs represent the biggest gold mine for potential new species. And I guess the second reason why I'm interested in it is because worldwide shallow water coral reefs are in decline, um, primarily due to anthropogenic things and also climate change and uh, increasing ocean temperatures. And so there's this hypothesis that as oceans warm, why won't the shallow species just seek deeper refuge in deeper reefs? Well, as we're finding now through drop that these deep reefs harbor a already adapted, unique, specialized community there. So it raises a really interesting question of if, what do we know about this deep reef community and how will it change in response to climate change? And that's one of the motivating factors that you know, drives me for this particular project. So the question was, how are um, reef, reef organisms, both shallow and deep reef organisms, evolving or adapting to um, being in new uh, areas for invasive species or responding to invasive species um, when the species come in? Uh, there's a little bit of research going on to see how lionfishes are changing their depth distributions in the Caribbean versus in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it turns out in the Caribbean they are much deeper and they um, reproduce much faster and eat much more in the Caribbean than they did in their native environments. But I think the really interesting questions are how are prey responding and what are the adaptations or what are the learning behaviors that prey items are doing to avoid lionfish or, or, or not. And right now, it doesn't seem to be that many of the predators that would be feeding, or similar type of fishes that would be feeding on lionfishes in the Indo-Pacific, they're not recognizing that lionfish could be prey for them, and they're not eating them very rapidly. Um, there's a few anecdotal evidence of some grouper and sharks eating them, but there's not a whole lot of evidence that the predators are recognizing them as prey. There is evidence, though, that uh, of pre predator avoidance for things that are being eaten by lionfish. So many species experienced a dramatic drop in their populations in the first couple of years of the lionfish invasion and they have stabilized now and some species of gobies are actually have been shown to you know be naive in the beginning but over time learn um, to avoid lionfish but some other species are still being naive so it's definitely a, a hot topic that um, can be further exploited Okay, so the question was, um, you know, anytime you enter a new environment, you're going to expect that you're going to find new things. And given how many things we found in just a few sites that we sampled, what is the estimate of the true diversity out there in these unsampled habitats worldwide? Um, 
in, we're, we're working now in the Caribbean, which has lower diversity than other tropical areas like the Indo-Pacific and the Coral Triangle. And yet, for the first three years that we were diving in just one locality, we would almost every dive come up with either a new species or a new depth record or a new geographic range or some new interaction. Um, we are just now hitting the asymptote where every dive we're stopping seeing something new. Um, my anticipation is that with the Caribbean, there'll be another 10 years worth of submersible samples bef diving before we even get a grasp on what the habitat is, and that's just for the Caribbean. So you might see, you know, I wouldn't say a du double the amount of species in, of coral reef fishes, but I definitely think that you will see um, huge percentages, especially when we start diving in the Indo-Pacific. So it's, it's extremely exciting.